Telemax highlights. And here's your host, Carlos McConney. Here we go. Thanks for joining me. We've put together a great show for you today. So before we get started, let's take a quick look at what's coming up in the next half hour. Special honor. San Sebastián is a 2016 European capital of culture. Recycled art. One man from Britain and his hubcap sculptures. Clear Perspectives, a Berlin window cleaner and his photo collection. The city of San Sebastián has recently completed the opening celebrations to mark its role as one of this year's European capitals of culture. Located on the north coast of Spain in the Basque country, it is home to a vibrant scene of cultural expression surrounding the everyday lives of its inhabitants. We headed to San Sebastián in order to catch up on the festivities which launch a year of events aiming to promote stronger ties with the rest of Europe and foster understanding in a region which has seen much political unrest in its recent history. This bridge in San Sebastian lies at the heart of the opening ceremony, both physically and metaphorically. Because 1,000 local actors, professionals, and amateurs came together to build what they call a bridge of coexistence. A few hours earlier, drummers marched through the streets. It's a tradition that dates back to the early 19th century. Today, the aim was to motivate as many people as possible to join in because participation is San Sebastian's maxim as the European capital of culture. We believe culture is a, a, a very good tool to promote uh, a better way of living together. And the way of doing it is, is by asking people to participate. So the thing is, the is people, the citizens, is the, are the one who might create this new framework, this new, new, new society. It's not us. We are only facilitating giving them tools in order to reach this goal. The city of San Sebastian has some 180,000 inhabitants and a rich cultural scene. The Basque Symphony Orchestra performs in the Kursaal Auditorium. And the Teatro Victoria Eugenia is one of the venues hosting the annual Jazz Aldia Festival with stars from around the world. The San Telmo Museum is dedicated to the history of the Basque country. It will host a double exhibition on a Basque art collective from the 1960s and contemporary artists from across Europe, in keeping with San Sebastian's motto of dialogue. It's a project which has an epicenter in San Sebastian, but tries, tries to spread all over the, the territory around San Sebastian and even all over Europe because we have, as you probably know, that we got, we got several activities that we call embassies that they promote like a, a European audiences by traveling throughout Europe and bringing our values and our ideas uh, to all over Europe. La Concha, meaning the muscle, is one of San Sebastian's two beaches. The other one, Zuriola Beach, is nearby. San Sebastian is considered the birthplace of Europe's surf culture, and it has a long history as a seaside resort. And just behind them, an exhibition on historical drinking fountains from the past century. They used to dot the city, but they gradually disappeared. Artist Miter Lopez rediscovered them in warehouses and refurbished them with the aim of sparking conversations, and it was a success. Yesterday, a woman was sitting in, on the bench, and she started talking with the children that she didn't know, but they were playing with the fountains. And then another came, man came, didn't understand what was going on. And the relationship that they are created here to create new dialogues and conversations. The people of San Sebastian love good food. Many of the city's restaurants have Michelin stars. So-called pinchos are popular here. The small snacks come in many varieties, and you eat them standing at the bar before moving on to the next one, perfect before the grand opening. As 50,000 spectators looked on, the Maria Cristina Bridge was transformed into a bridge of dialogue. 
symbolizing the fact that conflicts can only be resolved through dialogue. Expectations for the opening ceremony were high. Afterward, opinions were divided. Very nice, very original. I didn't like it at all. It's important to engage in dialogue. That's never been an issue. Here, people always argue and hold different points of view. But the point is to talk and listen to each other. It's a good idea to take the bridge as a symbol of a place where people meet and engage in dialogue, as a symbol of hospitality, especially against the backdrop of recent Basque history. It gives you hope for the future. After the show, everyone could play with light and shadow on the bridge. This shows that shaping the city's culture in the coming months will lie in the hands of its inhabitants. My colleague Linda Bitka, who you might have seen in the German version of Euromax, well, she went on a little adventure in Switzerland. She was at the Lox Snowboarding Open, and despite having no experience snowboarding, she decided she wanted to find out what it takes to ride down an enormous halfpipe. It's a highlight at the Lachs Open in Switzerland. This half pipe is 200 meters long, 22 meters wide, and almost 7 meters high. As a novice on the slope, I'm amazed. This is where the best freestyle snowboarders battle for the title, worth more than 460,000 euros. This is the biggest half pipe ever. For this kind of sport, you not only have to be tough, but also a little bit crazy. Like the 27-year-old Danny Davis from the United States, he's one of the world's top freestyle snowboarders. He won many titles, including the gold medal for halfpipe twice. He's one of the favorites here at the Lux Open. What's so special about snowboarding beside the cool outfits? What's great is it's, in our world, it's not supposed to be perfect, it's not a race, it's, uh, it's about creative freedom and snowboarding. I want to try this out. Would you help me and give me some advice? Go to the flat slope, you know, <laughs> and uh, and take your time. Don't go fast. Don't feel you need to like go fast and do the whole mountain the first day. Just take it at your own pace. What is the worst thing that has ever happened to you? I've broken bones and things like that, you know, so that... Which? Oh, all over. Femur, ankles. Yeah, I've had a few, few injuries, but that's part of the... Uh, part of the game. Well then, wish me luck. Even for beginners like me, Lux is a great place to give this a try. There is even a freestyle academy down in the valley. Even some pros practice their stunts on the academy's 1,000 square meters. Without snow, of course, like me today. Finally, I get a board under my feet and it takes me down. It's steep, but the pace is nice and slow. And now for the slope, but here I have a pro by my side. Nadja Kuni is the snowboard teacher who will guide me on my first attempt on the snow. Can you try to hold the knees with the knees? Genau, das ist normal, das mit der Balance ist verdammt schwierig. Maybe you think I'm a bit crazy to try this out for the first time in my age, but isn't it all about having fun? I think so. Oh. Oh. Okay, maybe I don't look very professional yet, but it's definitely a lot of fun, even if I'm a long way off from the true test the half pipe. <laughs> yeah, not so bad for my first try. I have to show this to my snowboard idol, Danny Davis. Maybe he'll have a few more tips in store. <laughs> With Danny's help, I give it a try. <laughs> That's the turn. That's what you gotta learn. 
Because you can't stay on one edge the whole time. Okay, you want to be learn. toes, heels, toes, toes heels, heels, toes, yeah, heels. Yeah, and that's okay. That's the love. Then you're surfing, and you're not just falling down the hill. Thank you. You'll be a snowboarder <laughs> one day. <laughs> Until then, it's practice, practice, practice. But there are some situations where even practice won't help. The weather played havoc with Danny Davis in the semifinals. He couldn't show his best side and was eliminated. Japanese high flyer Ayumi Hirano, who's just 17 years old, ended up winning the Lux Open 2016. In second and third place came Patrick Burgener and David Hablitze. Both are Swiss and train here often. Lutz is the place to be for this sport, but as an absolute beginner, I definitely have my work cut out for me. Maybe I can't snowboard like a pro, but I can party like one. And Apleshi is also part of the game, isn't it? Of course. So cheers. 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 <laughs> And while we are enjoying unusually mild temperatures in Berlin, things are a lot different up in Norway. But over there, they sure know how to make the best of the extreme weather conditions. They put together an annual event which takes place on a frozen lake. And the highlight is a nighttime concert where the musicians play instruments made out of ice. It's true, and here are the images to prove it. As day draws to a close in the Norwegian ski resort of Yilo and the temperature plunges to well below freezing, you sometimes hear strange sounds for miles around. Once a year, one of the strangest and certainly coldest music festivals in the world takes place here on a frozen lake. The musicians play instruments made entirely out of ice. The audience members are impressed. This is really impressive stage. It's, uh, I'm still wondering how they made it, but it looks amazing. To experience uh, under the full moon, in the forest, on the water, it's magic. Sarah Willis, who plays French horn with the Berlin Philharmonic, attended the festival this year. And she reported on it in her weekly DW classical music show, Sarah's Music. Where it's absolutely freezing, but I'm glad it's freezing because I'm standing on a Norwegian percussionist Terje Isungset came up with the idea for the festival in 2006. He has an ecological message. Now then is the, uh, the climate changes and all those things on the ice is melting. Uh, and I think to deal with ice and water uh, becomes very important as a comment to all those things. The annual festival lasts three days and always attracts thousands of visitors. The 26 musicians who will perform make their instruments themselves almost at the last minute before the concerts. They use ice that's been collected from the frozen lakes around. It takes some time to fine tune the instruments and find a suitable sound. We try new things. Uh, I normally, well, my job is to come up with ideas, um, put together the program, the artists. And, uh, yeah, please. So uh, this year we have this enormous uh, tuba kind of thing, but we also have the, the drums, the African style drums that we haven't done before. The annual highlight is the midnight concert on Yilo's frozen lake. It's improvised from beginning to end. The musicians never know if their instruments will survive the two-hour concert. They tend to melt and the sound changes accordingly. This 
This is strange and unique music performed in the Arctic chill. Most people don't really care for hubcaps. After all, they just protect your car wheels and at some point will end up as trash scrap in the dump. But as the saying goes, one man's trash is another man's treasure. And now one man from England has made a name for himself in the art world by recycling hubcaps and turning them into organic looking sculptures. He calls them hubcap creatures and this is why. Hubcaps turned into works of art. Their traditional function may be to protect the wheels of a car, but for Ptolemy Elrington, the small discs are perfect for creating sculptures, especially of animals. People think a hubcap is just a hubcap, but actually they're made out of lots of different types of plastic, so they're very versatile. We've got all the different shapes and things to play with. Basically, that's what I'm doing. I'm playing when I'm working. The artist makes adjustments to the hubcaps in his studio. Having studied art and design in the 1980s, he now works for himself as a sculptor. He generally avoids using photographs, sketches or templates as a basis for his work. Instead, he lets himself be guided by the form of the hubcaps themselves. Sometimes I am surprised because it's, there are some elements within the materials that I use that kind of take over and, and, and give it a certain character. And other times I'm surprised at quite how difficult it can be. Sometimes I can spend all day just working on one little thing and never quite getting it right and working it again and again and again. And, and I don't know why I know when it's right, but I just do and then I'm happy. Ptolemy L. Rington has been creating art out of hubcaps for 15 years now. Some creations can be completed in a day, others he spends weeks on. The thing about creating, whether you're painting or drawing or making sculpture, um, the, the, the most important thing is to be able to look properly. And it's about um, making your eye and your brain work together properly um, so that you can translate the shapes that you see in your mind into something more physical in front of you. He's created hundreds of sculptures. A single piece fetches an average of 1,000 euros. The price depends on the amount of time invested in the work. Some can cost up to 40,000 euros. I kind of stumbled on that as an idea because I used to live near a bend where they used to collect on the side of the road. And after a while, I started picking them up because um, it just seemed such a waste. The, the council were coming along and collecting them and they were going into landfill. And um, some of them were really beautiful designs. He still scours the streets for material to include in his artworks and continues to collect the hubcaps he finds on the way to his studio in Brighton. His collection is in the hundreds. He orders them according to brand, size, material and shape. He also gets some as gifts from his friends and family. That's a Seat one. That's got some, a little bit of bend to it, which is good. But the thing that first would like, I'd notice with this, would be this oval shape here and this shape here. Because already, to me, that's looking like a shark's mouth. So if you spin it round, you've got this kind of shape going on. He also incorporates old shopping trolleys and spare car parts into his pieces. Recycling is an integral part of his work. I always try to include some kind of recycling aspect just to try to get that message as part of what I do out there. Um, I think uh, the way that the world is at the moment, I'm never going to run out of raw materials and I certainly don't think I'm going to run out of the drive to make things out of them. So in the future, I'm just going to keep on doing what I like doing. He's currently working on a dinosaur made from old bicycle frames. Ptolemy Elrington is a master of breathing new life into old materials. 
Up next, we will meet a photographer who sidelines as a window cleaner, or maybe it's the other way around. Well, either way, Berlin-based Lars Nickel has gained access to photographing genuine Berliners in the comfortable setting of their own homes. He has parlayed his dual job situation into his very own recognizable artistic style and concept, which has led to the publication of this book with some of his favorite images. In his job as a window cleaner, Lars Nickel gets to meet all sorts of people. Nickel is actually a photographer by profession and has turned his lens on many of his clients. The only thing his subjects have in common is that they can all afford a window cleaner. My works are portraits with the added dimension that they offer a tiny view into the subjects' homes. I wouldn't call it voyeuristic, and my aim isn't just to show how people live or decorate their space. I just enjoy the interplay. But who wouldn't be curious to see what it looks like behind the windows of Berlin? Lars Nickel has somewhere between two and three hundred clients scattered across the city. He usually cleans their windows twice a year. Nickel came up with the idea for his sideline profession seven years ago when he realized he couldn't make ends meet as a photographer. I mainly clean windows for private individuals because that's a niche that's not addressed by the larger companies. When I clean windows in private homes, I also develop personal relationships. That's good for my photo project and it makes for pleasant working conditions. Nickel uses an analog roll film camera and natural light. That allows him to set up his camera almost anywhere he chooses. He takes about five or ten pictures each time. That's all he needs. About two-thirds of his clients say yes to having a portrait taken along with their window cleaning. You're in a familiar environment, which does help. But it's still a completely unfamiliar situation. You've let a stranger into your apartment, and you're just standing there. And suddenly you ask yourself, what is he seeing anyhow? What's behind me? And what am I revealing about the place that I live in? Nichols' photos have also been published as a book, something that probably surprised some of his subjects. But a Berlin-based publisher snapped up the project. You see young hip couples from the Mitte district, you know the kind, right next to a contented retiree from Charlottenburg who is reliving her memories. They're connected by the fact that they live somewhere, but their living spaces are as different as the people themselves. Lars Nickel chose 80 portraits for his photo volume. It's titled Bella Taj. The book also includes short profiles of his subjects. This is a midwife from the Prenzlauer Berg district, and it's one of my favorite pictures, because it fits so well with the title, Belletage, with the furnishings and the picture frame, and the picture itself, which likely dates from the Wilhelminian era. Last year, Nickel was even invited to exhibit his portraits at the Deutsches House at New York University. It's also a portrait of Berlin, a contemporary portrait of Germany, and how people furnish their homes. It's probably a bit different than how it would look in Poznan or Warsaw, for example. And of course, in the other direction, in Paris or London, people furnish their homes differently too. Even with one book under his belt, Lars Nickel cannot afford to give up his day job. But he's still happy that his clients and the world have been given the chance to see that he's not only a reliable window cleaner, he's also an artist. That's all we have time for today. Thanks for watching. Remember to check us out on social media, and we are always glad to receive your messages, so please keep writing in. 
I'm glad you could join us and look forward to seeing you again very soon. Take care.